Well, good morning, Calvary. You can turn to Haggai chapter 2. And, you know, it's, uh, I just want to establish this. It's never, um, you never need to be ashamed to look in the table of contents. And especially when you're looking up Haggai, you don't need to be ashamed to look in the table of contents to find Haggai, okay? Of course, we have our devices now, and it doesn't matter. We type it, and there it is. But we'll have that on the screen for you, too. Um, I want to start by just asking, raise your hand, if you don't mind, if you've been a part of Calvary for at least seven years, okay? Seven years or more. So many of you. Okay, thank you. Um, and I picked the number seven just because of the upheaval of the past seven years. If you were here at least seven years ago, it was very different, right? It, the, the church was different. Uh, it looked different. I mean, it literally looked different. It's a different color now, right? And this room looks different and the lobby looks different and the people who are up front leading you are different and um, many of the leaders that we have loved and had a profound impact on us have moved on. Many of the people that we worshiped with, that we loved worshiping with have moved on and it's just, it's different. Um, so I want to, first of all, thank all of you for your faithfulness to this church through many years, in some cases, many decades of faithfulness. Uh, we, we are on your shoulders and we are grateful. We are grateful that you are still here uh, and that you've weathered the storm of all the, the changes and difficulties of the last several years. And I, I you know, if that's you, I, I want you to know this passage today, it re it's really for you. It's for all of us, but it's especially for those of you who have been here a long time and you look back and you just feel the pain and the loss of what used to be here at Calvary. So I, I am just praying for all of you that fit that description that you'll hear from God, from his word today. I think he wants to encourage you and all of us. So the, the series is, uh, that we're in is Rebuild. We're talking about building and we're inviting uh, everybody to come and be part of what we're building here at Calvary and what God is building through us. And we're looking at these Old Testament books of Ezra and Haggai because those books deal with the rebuilding of the temple of God in the Old Testament. And what are we building here today? We're building a temple. Uh, not a building, but just like we saw in 1 Corinthians 3 a few weeks back, we're building a, a temple which is a community. The community of God's people is where God lives, where he's uniquely encountered and worshipped. And that's what we're building here. And so we want to learn from what God says in his word about that rebuilding process for these people um, 500 some years before Jesus. And so that's what we're looking at. Um, before I read from Haggai, I want to read a couple verses from Ezra, okay, to set this up. Haggai and Ezra are companion books in the Old Testament. Ezra tells the story of rebuilding the temple. Haggai is the prophet who speaks to the people who are rebuilding the temple. And so they go together and we're looking at both. So in Ezra chapter 3, and Tim started talking to us about this last week, the rebuild process begins. And it begins with offering. We give who we are, what we have to the Lord. And then he takes that and he uses it and does his thing with us. And um, we saw that last week. And as you keep reading chapter 3, the, the foundation of the temple is laid and it's commissioned. And then this happens. All right, listen to this and see if you relate to this. Ezra 3 verse 12 says, But many of the priests and Levites and heads of fathers' houses, old men who had seen the first house, wept with a loud voice when they saw the foundation of this house being laid. Though many shouted aloud for joy, so that the people could not distinguish the sound from the joyful shout, from the sound of the people's weeping. For the people shouted with a great shout and the sound was heard far away. So you see what's happening? They're, they're rebuilding here and they're going and, the, and most of these people uh, don't even remember the old temple. 
that Solomon had built and how glorious it was and the, the, the heyday of Jerusalem that came from that. And, and, um, but a few remember that. And those who remember that, now that this new temple is being built, they're like, this is, this is nothing. This is nothing compared to what we remember. This is just not as glorious as what we used to have. And, and it's a giant struggle. And so they're mourning the loss of that. And at the very same time, people who don't remember that are just excited to be along for the ride and see what God's going to do. They're excited, and so there's just this hubbub. And there's room for both of those things, right? There's room for the mourning and for the excitement. In fact, we need, really need both. Uh, I mean, when we have loss, we've got to grieve it. And when great things have happened, we, we celebrate that and we build on that. Uh, and yet we, we need to move forward, don't we? And so what I love about this is that it, it's like God is reaffirming as he does throughout his word that we need all the generations. We need the, the wisdom of those who have gone before us. We need the, the energy and the innovation of the younger. I mean, if that all comes together, just think. Think what we could do. And so the prophet, Haggai, is going to speak right into this. Because as the temple keeps being rebuilt, this is a continual problem. You still have people who are like, ah, but what we used to have, and it's just so hard, and they, and they continue to mourn, and, and Haggai speaks directly to that. So let's hear what he says. Haggai chapter 2 Starting in verse 3, he says, Who is left among you who saw this house in its former glory? How do you see it now? Is it not as nothing in your eyes? Yet now, be strong, O Zerubbabel, the one who's leading this rebuild, declares the Lord. Be strong, O Joshua, son of Jehozadak, the high priest. Be strong, all you people of the land, declares the Lord. Work, for I am with you, declares the Lord of hosts. According to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt, my spirit remains in your midst. Fear not. For thus says the Lord of hosts, yet once more in a little while, I will shake the heavens and the earth and the sea and the dry land and I will shake all nations so that the treasures of all nations shall come in and I will fill this house with glory, says the Lord of hosts. The silver is mine and the gold is mine, declares the Lord of hosts. The latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former, says the Lord of hosts. And in this place I will give peace, declares the Lord of hosts. Powerful, encouraging words from this prophet to a group of people who really needed the encouragement. And I think a lot of us, we really need encouragement during this rebuild. And I think God is ready to give it to us. And so I think here's what, uh, here are my words for kind of the theme of this passage as I see it. I think what we learn here is that as we rebuild, we are not building to go back to the past or to stay in the present, but move towards God's future for us. That's what we're doing. And it is not easy. But I think that is what God is calling us to do. And so uh, I just have a few observations about why this passage is encouraging us to build toward a future. Okay? And uh, let me just mention a few of those reasons. First of all, I see that we build toward the future because we shouldn't be hanging on to the past. We shouldn't be hanging on to the past. Should we celebrate the past? Should we learn from the past? Should we grieve losses from the past? Of course, of course, all of that we do. But hang on to the past? I think the word of God is calling us not to do that. So um, I just turned 40 and already uh, I find myself doing things like hearing the music that you guys listen to, and I'm like, really? That's, I mean, <laughs> when I was growing up, okay, we had better music, and I'm, I'm, I'm hearing myself say these kind of things. It's like, stop, stop, don't do that, but you know, you just can't help it, right? 
as you get older, you have these fond memories, kind of these idyllic memories of, of your own childhood or your own past, and um, you just can't help it, right? That's the way it is. And I love that in the words of the prophet here, God affirms that. He affirms, you people who saw the old temple, you have those memories, and those are very important to you, and God recognizes that. Right, he even says uh, in verse three, we, we just read it. He says, y- I know you saw that and this doesn't seem like much. In fact, he says, it's, this is like nothing in your eyes. And I think a lot of us feel that way. You know, um, as we age, the world changes, our church changes, our town changes. Just there's all this change and upheaval around us and it's hard. And God knows that and so he, he recognizes that and kind of validates that in these people. But he also says in the next verse, verse 4, yet now, now, today, right here, be strong. Be strong and work and move forward because I have something more for you. So God is allowing the grief, but he's also calling us not to just stay in it and live in it, but to press on. And uh, Harry Ironside, uh, many of you have heard of him, the Bible teacher, he says about this event, there is room both for the weeping and the shouting. The two are not discordant, but blend in one majestic strain, all alike to the praise and glory of the God of all grace. There's room for both. And we need both. Um, You know, uh, one reason that we shouldn't get hung up on the past is because, you know, frankly, the past wasn't as great as we remember it, right? Nostalgia kind of paints things differently. And um, honestly, you know, um, this is a little harsh, but I'm just going to say it. If you are a whiner, and we all are at times, but if you're a whiner about what's going on right now and how good it used to be, what do you think you were back then? Probably still a whiner, right? Like, there's good things and bad things about every era. Here's what um, the journalist Brooks Atkinson said. Maybe you've heard this famous quote. In every age, the good old days were a myth. No one ever thought they were good at the time. For every age has consisted of crises that seem intolerable to the people who lived through them. It's a fallen world. It's fallen now. It was fallen in the past. It'll be fallen until Jesus comes and makes it what it needs to be, right? And there are ups and downs all along the way. Um, Listen to what King Solomon said. The wisest man who ever lived, okay, we should listen to him. And in Ecclesiastes 7 verse 10 He says, do not say, why were the former days better than these? Do not say, why were the former days better than these? For it is not from wisdom that you ask this. So it's not wisdom to get hung up on the past. And I think maybe that's uh, a big reason why Paul, remember in Philippians chapter 3, Paul talks about considering everything as loss even those things that seemed so good and that he would maybe have wanted to hang on to. He says, I'm considering it all lost for the sake of knowing Jesus and forgetting what lies behind. I press on to what lies ahead because God has something more. God has something for us in the future and so we work toward that because we don't need to be hung up on the past. Number two We build toward the future because God is strengthening us to build right now. God is strengthening us to build right now. Did you hear that in verse four? Yes, yes, the the past, yet now, yet now, be strong. He says, be strong, Zerubbabel, the leader. Be strong, Joshua, the high priest. And then he says, be strong, all of you people. All of you people of the land. And I like that, you know, um, We know that a lot is on leaders. We know that leaders have a role and it's important, but all throughout scripture, it's everybody. It's all the people of God that contribute, right? It's all the parts of the body that make the body work. And so 
this rebuild that we're in the middle of here, who do we need to be part of it? We need everybody, all of you. All of you have something to contribute to this that nobody else can. Be strong. And then he says, work for I am with you. Work for I am with you, declares the Lord. Um, Here's what I love about that line. Did you hear that he said, work because I'm with you? He didn't say work and then, if you perform well enough, then I'll be with you. No. Work because I'm already with you. I'm already there. And that's the gospel. You know, that's the gospel right there. And if you're not a Christian or if you're on the fence about Christianity or wrestling with Christianity, um, so often we understand or misunderstand that Christianity is you perform for God and then he's with you and he saves you or takes you to heaven or whatever it is if you perform. And that is the opposite of the gospel. It's so clear in scripture that the gospel is no you can't perform well enough for God we're fallen we're weak but we don't have to get to God because he already came to get us he sent Jesus to get us and it's because of that that we get to move forward so we're not building to get the favor of God or the blessing of God we're building because we already have it and it's propelling us forward Work for I am with you. Um, Remember Ephesians chapter 2 verse 10 talks about how God has these good works in store for us that he wants us to do. And, And rather than just pressuring us or whatever like, hey, you better do these good works that I planned for you. He says, you are God's workmanship that he has created in Christ Jesus to do those good works so we don't do those things to to, in order to become who God wants us to be we do those things because God is already making us who he wants us to be and so we move forward with that power God is with us his spirit remains among us so God is strengthening us to build right now and so we build toward the future and then number three We build toward the future because God has promises to fulfill. So as we are moving forward, we are anticipating God doing some things in us and through us that he has said he will do. And that that was the case for this group of people. And that's why Haggai says in verse 5, Hey, you know, you, you work and I'm with you according to the covenant that I made with you when you came out of Egypt. In other words, he's saying, remember your history? Remember you were slaves? And then I brought you out and it seemed impossible, but I did that and I promised that I was going to do that and then I did. And right now, to these people, you've been in exile, but I have promised that I would bring you back and reestablish you and rebuild my temple and rebuild this city and I'm going to do that and you can hang on to that. Now, for me, and probably for a lot of us, um, that's nice that they had those promises. What about us? Okay, do these promises apply to us? Or, you know, what, what promises of God can we hang on to right now? And the more I thought about it, the more I realized, wow, there's so many, so many promises of God that we can hang on to as we move forward in our life right here doing this rebuild that he has for us. And and I would just invite you, take some time, reflect on the promises of God that are for us and for you and hang on to those. So I, I, you know, um, as I reflected and thought of a few, I'll just share uh, some that came to my mind. I thought of John 3.16, most famous verse in the Bible. If you've been around church, it's almost white noise, right? After a while. But John 3.16, God says that he loved this world so much, including you, so much, that he sent his son for you so that anyone, anyone, whoever you are, whatever you've done, whatever you haven't done, whatever your story is, Anyone who believes in Jesus will not perish, but have eternal life. 
I mean, that, that, we can hang on to that. If we believe in Jesus, whatever else is true about us or our world or anything, if we put our faith in Jesus, we are not going to perish. We're not going to face judgment, even though we deserve it. Jesus already took it for us. We're not going to experience that. Instead, we're going to have life, life, eternal. We can hang on to that. I thought of the promise in Philippians chapter 1, verse 6, where Paul tells these believers, the one who started a good work in you will carry it on to completion. God does not start working our lives to just abandon us and let things happen as they may. God starts a work in a church and in an individual in order to finish it. He's going to do what he set out to do. It's going to happen. Uh, I thought of John 16, 33. A couple promises there, a good one and a bad one, okay? John 16, 33, remember Jesus says, in this world you will have trouble. Thanks for that promise. Um, it's very true. And, he, and, and I mean, but really Jesus recognizes that and that's very reassuring, isn't it? Like this is a hard life. This fallen world, it's hard here. And, and that's going to happen. But take heart, because I have overcome the world. Jesus promises that he's bigger than the world, that he's going to overcome the world. It's as good as done. Aren't you glad? I mean, that's something to cling to, isn't it? In these very difficult days. Uh, I thought of the promise Jesus made the first time he ever mentioned the church. And he said, remember, I will build my church I will build my church. The gates of hell will not stand against it. That's a promise. I mean, as we're building, that's a promise to cling to, isn't it? We can build the kingdom of God confidently because Jesus already said he is going to build it and nothing can stop him. And we're part of that. Um, one more promise that I want to mention for us. I think this is so uh, apt for what, where we are and what we're experiencing. And we're gonna put this one on the screen because I want us to see it and soak it in. This comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which is all about how Jesus really has come back from the dead. He really did. He came back from the dead. He conquered death. And at the end of this chapter in verse 58, Paul says, therefore, because Jesus did that, because he's alive, because death is conquered, my beloved brothers, be steadfast immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And it just feels like it is sometimes, doesn't it? I mean, you're going through life and you're trying to walk with God and you're trying to contribute to his cause. And sometimes it's just so discouraging. It's like, does any of this even matter? Is anything even resulting from what we're trying to do here? And and God says, yes, it does matter. And, and when you are doing my work, I'm doing things through you. Things are getting accomplished. Maybe you don't see it right here, right now. But man, I am doing things through you. It is never in vain. It is never futile when you're doing my work. That is so reassuring. So we build toward a future because we have a God who has made promises to us and we anticipate him fulfilling those promises. We also build toward the future because what we're building, it is eternal. We are building something eternal. We're not just building a nice uh, kind of social club with a spiritual dimension to it for right here in Longmont during this era. We're part of something, uh, Tim referenced it as he was praying, we're part of something massive, global, that will last on into eternity. That's what we're part of. And so what we're building, it's going to last forever. It's going to last forever. Um, did you hear in Haggai's words, he talks about God shaking the, the creation and God shaking the nations and how when God does those things, um, that the, all throughout Old Testament prophecy, we have this imagery of shaking and, and God doing that. And, and the imagery is telling us that God is the one bringing about everything he wants to bring about through world history, right? We saw that at the beginning of Ezra 
where God's the one stirring in the heart of these kings to make these things happen because he's the Lord of history and he's overseeing all of this. Um, I love, okay, and if you, any of you who are Bible students, don't you love when the New Testament quotes the Old Testament and explains it? It's like, okay, now I know that I'm not misinterpreting this, okay? So here's what the book of Hebrews says about the words of Haggai, okay? We're gonna put them on the screen. The book of Hebrews, see that quote at the beginning, yet once more I will shake not only the earth but also the heavens. It comes right out of what we just read in Haggai. Here's what Hebrews says about this. Listen to this. This phrase, yet once more, indicates the removal of things that are shaken. That is, things that have been made in order that the things that cannot be shaken may remain. Therefore, let us be grateful for receiving a kingdom that cannot be shaken. And thus let us offer to God acceptable worship with reverence and awe, for our God is a consuming fire. So, so you see what's happening? Uh, this world is very shakable. I mean, don't you feel that? <laughs> I, I, we are so, so easily rattled and shaken and tossed around and the world is just shaken and it feels like things are unstable, falling apart. And God says, yeah, you're right. This temporary world is very shakable. And God says, I am actually overseeing the shaking to bring about my ends. And what's going to remain is this kingdom that I'm establishing that can never, ever be shaken. That is great news, isn't it? We have a kingdom that cannot be shaken. It's eternal. We're building something eternal. Number five. We build toward the future because the best is yet to come. The best is yet to come. Um, Frank Sinatra was correct. <laughs> the best is yet to come, babe, and won't that be fine? And yes, Frank, it will be fine because just look what God has in store for us. Shane read from it this morning, Revelation 21 and 22. God is setting up his kingdom. He's gonna be with us. No more tears, pain, sickness, death, anything. It's all going to be as it should be. That's what's in store for you. If you're struggling, just Revelation 21 and 22, open it up, soak it in. That's what's going to happen. In fact, that's what's going to be true of your life, your entire life, except for this little brief prologue here. After this little tiny blip here in this messed up, fallen world, it's all going to be as it should be, forever. And the prophet is trying to tell these people, look, you're looking backwards as though the best was behind you. No, the best is in front of you still. Can you believe that? And as good as you think it was, back when there was Solomon's temple and things seemed great, as good as you think it was back then, just wait, just wait till you see what I'm going to do next just wait. Um, so theologically, there's kind of a, an issue here. Haggai says in verse 9 that the latter glory of this house shall be greater than the former. What is he talking about? Um, remember, when Moses built the tabernacle, the glorious presence of God filled the tabernacle. Remember that? When Solomon built the first temple and finished it and commissioned it, what happened? The glorious presence of God filled the temple. Now we have this temple, the second temple, and as they finish that temple and commission that temple, does the glorious presence of God fill that temple? No, it doesn't. Isn't that weird? We don't read anything about that. Maybe that's a reason so many of these people were so disillusioned. 
It's like, here's this temple, it's smaller, it's not as luxurious, we don't even have the presence of God or the Ark of the Covenant or things like that. And so what did the prophet mean? How could, if the presence of God never even came to that temple, how can the prophet say, this is gonna have greater glory than the other temple? And the answer comes over 500 years later. Because this temple is still there. It's been expanded and refurbished by King Herod, but this temple is still there. And the glorious presence of God comes into the temple, not in a cloud or a bright light or something like that, but in the form of a human being. Jesus Christ walks into this temple. And that is greater than the glory that they saw in these other temples, isn't it? Because this is not just uh, uh, something impressive or awe-inspiring. This is God in the flesh coming to get us, coming to pay for our sin, coming to rise from the dead for us. The, the, the glory was gonna be better. The best was yet to come for these people because Jesus was going to come. And you know what? For us, the best is yet to come for us because Jesus is going to come back, isn't he? He's going to come back. Let me read one other verse from Revelation 21, as Shane referenced this morning. As John uh, is having this vision of what it's going to be like for us in the future, and he's seeing this beautiful city, and he says in uh, Revelation 21, verse 22, I saw no temple in the city. Okay, we're talking about temples, we're talking about building a temple. Well, at the end, there's no temple. Why, why is there no temple? For its temple is the Lord God, the Almighty, and the Lamb. We don't need a temple with the presence of God because at the end, we're always in the presence of God. He lives. He is manifested right here with us forever. That's what we have to look forward to. And that is what we are building toward. Some questions for us to ponder in light of these words. What is the sense of loss that you're carrying right now, just like these people were? What is the sense of loss that you're carrying? The things that, that you are mourning? And what does healthy grieving of those losses look like? For you. You know, if we don't go through that grief, then we're just going to live there. We're just going to stay there. We're going to be stifled from moving into what God has next. But what, what are they? Name them. Give them to him. Let him bring you through that process of, of grieving and letting them go and then, and then saying, okay, I'm ready for what's next. Number two, what promises of God do you need to hold on to right now? And I shared some that came to my mind. Just, I, I urge you, sit and think about this. What has God said in his word that he is doing and is going to do that you can anchor your life to during this stormy time? And then number three, what excites you about Calvary's future? Hey, we have good things going on here, don't we? It's not like it was, but God is doing something. Um, and Many of you are involved in those things. And if you're out there wondering, okay, what are those good things or what are the opportunities for me to be part of that? Come to, a, come to one of us. Come to me, talk to Tim or the welcome team. Um, learn about ways to serve, to plug in, to get connected and be part of this because not only should we be asking what's exciting us about the future, but we should be asking what's my role? What's my role in that? I'm part of this temple I'm part of the body. I have something to contribute. What might that be? Let's pray. We thank you for what you're building, Lord. We thank you for what you have built and ways you've blessed us in the past and things you've done in the past. Lord, you were, you were there. You were doing things. You were impacting us. We're grateful. We don't want to forget those things. 
And there's, there's pain in, in not having many of those things anymore. But, Lord, we believe, we believe the best is still coming. You're doing more. You're bringing us further. You have more for us. We want to experience that, Lord. We want to step into that. We want to be part of it. And I just pray for this church and all involved in this church and all who will be involved in this church. Unleash us and unleash our gifts, Lord, for the good of what you're up to. And we just can't wait to see more of what that is, Jesus, in your name. Amen.